Hey everyone, how y'all doing? My name is Mateo and I am from Machine Masters. Today I'm going to show you my mixing workflow, how I get started, how I get set up, and how I organize everything. The reason why I'm showing you this today is because organization is a huge part of the mixing process. It is really easy to get lost in a mix when you're dealing with tons of tracks. So some sessions I get range from like four tracks to 140 tracks. I mean, when you have a session that big, organization is going to make or break your session because realistically, to get through a huge mix like that requires a lot of time. And if you misplace something or forget where you are in the mix, it's really easy to have the mix fall apart. So let's get into this. Let's load up our DAW. First thing I'm going to do is create a new session. And I usually work at 24-bit 48K. It's uh, pretty standard to work there. Realistically, most people can't tell the difference between 48K and 96K or 192. Also, you'll typically end up mixing everything down to either 48K or 44.1. Save yourself the processing and the hard drive space and just keep it at 48K. You're usually never gonna export anything higher than that. For mixing purposes, I mostly get audio files at 48K. All right, we're gonna name our session. The beat is called Banana Split. Great, so I have a perfectly good blank session here. The first thing I do when I open up a new session is I create my master fader. First thing I'm going to load is my dither plugin. I use power dither and I'm going to set it to noise shape three. Great. The next thing I'm going to do is load up my metering plugin and my metering plugin of choice is Brainworks BX meter. I'm going to set it the way that I like. I like it off float. I like the look to be legacy and I like the representation of the audio to be C weighted. Next, I am going to load up a plugin that keeps track of how long I work. And this is really important for clients because they want to know how much they're going to have to pay me. So in order to be transparent with them, I just give them the logs and they can see exactly how long I worked on the sessions. So there we are, and it is now keeping track of time. The next thing I open up is my spectrum analyzer. I use Blue Cat's free spectrum analyzer. It is great, it's convenient, and it's free. And I have my own setting that I've set up for my own purposes, so I'm gonna set it there. And last but not least, I am going to load up a brick wall limiter which is McDSP's ML1. It is very transparent sounding and it does what I need and it's very powerful. The only adjustment that I make to this is I set the ceiling to minus 0.5 decibels. And the reason why I do that is because digital distortion can happen below zero. So it is possible to distort even before you think you're actually distorting. So I set the ceiling to minus 0.5 decibels, but realistically, I never mix that loud anyways. So I'm usually very far from that. Great, so we have our master meter set up. Now let's load in the stems. All right, so I'm gonna highlight all these stems and drag them into the clips. As we can see here, they are being converted into the appropriate format. Amazing. So now that they've all been converted, I am now going to load them up into the tracks window, which is going to fill up my edit window. Great. And now I'm going to set all the tracks so I can see everything in the window at once. So fit to window. Beautiful. Now, before I do anything else, it's really important to not blow out your ears. The thing is, a lot of times when people export their stems, 
they'll usually export the audio at basically like having the fader set to zero, which means a lot of these sounds are going to be loud. And if you play all of them at once, they're most likely going to distort your session. So I'm going to bring everything down. I usually bring them down to about minus 10 decibels. And I'm going to reset my master fader because I don't need that down by 10 decibels. But everything else is down by about 10 decibels, so 9.9. .9. Great. All right, so now that I've got the levels down, I've got my meter up now, I've got my master fader set. The next thing I do is I'm going to organize all the tracks in a particular order that I'm comfortable with so I can easily navigate through the session. So first thing I like to do is put any reference tracks at the top. So this right here is the reference track that the producer gave me. And I'm going to set that to the top and set it to mini because I don't need to see the waves. I just need to refer to it whenever I'm checking my mix compared to their mix. And I'm going to mute it because, like I said, I don't need it right now. The next thing I'm going to do is organize the rest of the tracks in their own groups. And I like to set drums at the top. So I'm going to look for my kick first. So we got kick. Then I'm going to look for snare. There is no snare. Uh, I usually like doing kick, snare, then hi-hat. So where's the hi-hat? So hats, blocks. Let's hear what this is. OK. Let's get uh, put the shaker up. Any sort of percussive elements I like to group together. Got the claps. Oh, the claps. All right, so let's listen to all the percussive elements together. So now that I've got my percussive elements together, I like to color code them. So I'm going to color them red. That's usually what I have my drums or percussive elements colored as. So the next thing I like to do is put my bass after my percussive elements. So I'm going to set bass up here, take a quick listen to it. Cool. That's definitely a synth. So I usually color code my bass as yellow. And then synths, I like to color code as purple. Yeah, that's good purple. And pump, what is pump? So also another synth. So we will color that purple as well. Which purple did I use? Oh boy. Ah, there we go. Great. So you can color your tracks any way you want. I like to color code them because I can visually tell what a track is just by looking at it because of the color coding. And I know percussive elements are always red for me. Uh, bass is always yellow and synths are always purple. And I use when I'm recording live music, like piano is usually a dark brown. Guitar is usually a light brown. If I've got vocal samples, I usually have them colored green. So you can use your own color coding formula, but those are the colors that I use for the various instruments. And it just really makes it easy for me to keep track of all the tracks in my mix, especially if I've got a mix of like 40, 50 tracks, things like that. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create subgroups. So the drums are going to be going through their own subgroup. Uh, the bass will be going through its own subgroup and you know, same thing for the synths. So for drums, I will set up one mono auxiliary. And I'll tell you why in a moment. One stereo auxiliary. So that's going to be for the drums. And then I'll have another mono auxiliary for the bass because bass doesn't need to be stereo. Well, depending on your track. But typically, most basses should be mono. And then the synths, they are going to be stereo auxiliary. So there we go. That's all my auxiliaries. So the reason why I created two auxiliaries for the drums is because the stereo auxiliary is for the subgroup to run all the drums through. But then the mono auxiliary I use 
for parallel compression for drums. And I have it in mono because usually the elements that I'm processing for parallel compression is just the kick and the snare. So let's do that. Great, and now I'm going to set the outputs, all of them, to the inputs of the various strips that I'm going to be running them through. And I set the strips to not be affected by soloing. So that way, if you solo a certain element within, say, the drum group, it's not going to uh, mute your drum strip or drum group channel. And then for my drum bus, I usually have it set to bus one. And usually my kick and the snare will go into it. Uh, I'm just going to set that to bus one. Great. Ooh, actually, I also forgot. I usually set up drum reverb. So another stereo auxiliary, drum verb. All right, so now we can see everything here. Everything is organized, it's color coded, and they're all going through their own groups. One last thing about the groups, one of the other reasons why I like putting everything through groups is because I'll usually apply a little bit of uh, processing to the overall groupings of the tracks. So I'll usually use like some sort of console emulation on the drum strips, the bass strip, the synths, all those things, just to help glue everything together a little bit better. I also tie my drum strip and drum bus together. So I'll group them and I'll call them drum out. That's because the drum bus has a separate output than the drum strip. It's not, I'm not actually routing the drum bus into the drum strip. So they're both going to be outputting audio together. And one of the last things that I'll do once I've done all this is figure out the tempo of the song. So if the producer didn't include the tempo, I just have to figure it out. So uh, let's take a listen to this. So according to Pro Tools, it's roughly 79 or 80. So let's check this out. I'm going to load up a click track. And we're going to hear if it lines up properly. <laughs> Let's jump ahead. All right, so 80 BPM seems to work really well with it. Perfect. Now remember, uh, getting the tempo is really important because if you have to make any sort of edits and things like that, you'll be assured that Whenever you're editing, you can set your window to grid mode and the cursor locks to the beat, which is nice. And even if you move things, you're not going to slightly nudge something over by a few samples. It'll just snap to the grid, which is convenient. And most importantly, if you want to set up any delays, you'll know that your delay will be in time because your session is in time. Now, a preference of mine is to actually move everything over a few bars in case I want to do any cool effects before the start of the song. So I'll usually move it to about 12 bars. So that way, if I want any cool like reverse reverb or delay kind of starting the song, I can do it. I have that option. All right. So that is how I set up a session. 
For those of you out there that don't do this, this is a good practice to get into. It, it's a great habit to have. And you can even create a template from this. I mean, you won't necessarily get the same stems all the time. So you can do this from scratch, but it will save you much more time as you're going through the session. So it's a little bit of setup, but uh, if you want to create a template out of this, then you can, and then you have it every time you start mixing. And these templates can also have plugins loaded onto, say, the subgroups that you know that you're going to use in most situations. Thanks again to all of you that checked out this tutorial. We really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions about what we covered in this tutorial, please feel free to leave it in the comment section below. Also, if you have any suggestions for future tutorials, also leave that in the comment section below. As always, please like and share this video and subscribe to Machine Masters to keep up with all our latest tutorials. Thank you everyone, have a great day.